Well, today's the day. We finally get to talk about all the things we want to talk about with NVIDIA's 30 series. So as you guys have already figured out, the Founders Edition had a day head, or day head start, if you will, on the benchmarks and stuff. And that clearly has become our baseline. How are the custom cards developed by the AIBs and the board partners going to compare to NVIDIA's own flagship Founders Edition? So we're going to go and kick off the gauntlet of aftermarket cards with the brand new RTX 3080 XC3, the, the name's a little different this time, Ryan, XC3 custom variant. You know what, guys? I got new merch. It's available now, crowdme.com slash jc2cents. We got zip up hoodies, we got tri blend, we got a new logo. I digress since 2012. It's a digress logo. You guys have been asking for that. But anyway, we're going to go ahead. We got all kinds of stuff zip up hoodies, beanies, polos. Don't take my word for it, because obviously I can't do this ad. So just look in the description below and you guys will find the link. Thanks. <laughs> if you guys haven't seen the baseline video, I highly recommend you go and watch that. But you're going to see how the numbers compare to this anyway in today's charts. It's pretty obvious that these two cards have very different design approaches. Um, where do we really start here? Well, one thing you have to know about NVIDIA. They control, believe it or not, how much freedom the AIB partners have in their cooler design. So even if the brands really wanted to go very, very outlandish, they still have to get approval from, AM, or from AMD. No, they don't talk to AMD. They talk to NVIDIA about NVIDIA cards. They talk to AMD about AMD cards. That's how it works, Jay. Jesus Christ, it's been almost a decade and you still can't get that right. Moving forward. This time around, it's interesting though, because this is probably the most out there NVIDIA has ever gone with their, um, their Founders Edition design. It doesn't follow reference spec in terms of the board layout or any of that. It's all custom. It doesn't follow any of the norms and obviously it's a whole new design. But the graphics card manufacturers and the, and the board partners are, I, I feel, kind of in this really weird position. They have to get, they have to make it new in some way. And I feel like that's some of the problem that you're gonna find with AIBs this time around is because this is a huge jump in performance over 20 series, I feel like they, they're pressured, maybe pressuring themselves into finding this huge jump in aesthetics. And that's really not gonna happen. So let's go ahead and talk about the 3080 here, um, the XC3. So this is not a for the win, so it doesn't have ICX technology. And EVGA has their own custom ICX cards available as well. I chose this model when, I, when we talked about which models to send because I wanted the ones that are closer to MSRP. Now MSRP being $699. In the Founders Edition card, I mistakenly said it's an $800 card because I'm so used to that Founders Edition $100 tax that doesn't exist this time around. So Founders Edition and MSRP are the same. So it's important to remember that this card is actually $50 more than the Founders Edition card. So the question is gonna be, do you get $50 more value? Well, before we get into the walk around of the card, let's go ahead and just show you guys the benchmarks. I know you guys hate when we string you along and show you at the end. I have no idea what the music's gonna be this time around, whether it was vastly different than normal because we're in a vastly different performance bracket of card these days, or whether or not we stuck to something familiar and, and, and comfortable. Yeah, that actually ties into the review, believe it or not.
So looking at the benchmarks, it should be absolutely no surprise that the custom card performs pretty much the same as the Founders Edition card, which is also a custom card. Remember, they're not reference PCBs. This is the custom PCB, this is not reference, and neither is the Founders Edition card. But the reason why, even though they have different boost clocks and such, and you look at all the different AIBs, they're all gonna have slightly different numbers on some go to 1715, some go to 1740, some go to like 1730. And the reason for that is just their various design specs, they determine where that boost clock should go. But don't forget, there's also NVIDIA's GP Boost 3.0, which will take the cards farther than those clocks every single time, as long as it's not running out of power or running out of temperature. So if it goes, we've got more headroom in terms of how much power we can draw from the core or from the you know, delivery system, and we've got plenty of headroom with temperature, then we're gonna go farther. And the reason why these cards perform so similar is the fact that they both go to over 1940 megahertz. What makes them different is how long they can sustain those boost clocks. And that's where the coolers really come into play when it comes to the aftermarket cards. And speaking of cooler, that's where we'll go ahead and start the comparison between the two cards. The FE card has that rear uh, axial fan that's a blow through style. So it has an overhanging exhaust, or not exhaust, but a heat pipe system with fins that blows straight through. We'll do another video specifically about whether or not that affects case temperature or your CPU temperature. I'm sure other folks have talked about it in their reviews already on the FE card, uh, but I felt it warranted its own video. But that's neither here nor there. This is about this card. It also has the single fan in the front that is a blower style fan, which will pull air in and push it out through the front of the card. The EVGA card, on the other hand, the uh, XC3 with the PX1 cooler, has three axial fans blowing downward on a very traditional setup. So down through the heat pipes and then through the fins and they come out like all four sides, which to be honest, performed exactly the same as the FE cooler, but at less RPM needed and much less acoustics. Now the FE is virtually silent on its factory fan curve and it has a zero RPM fan in the back. That fan in the rear that has the blow through is a zero RPM fan. And all the custom cards now moving forward pretty much have zero RPM profiles where until they're under a certain amount of load and reach a certain temperature, the fans don't turn on trying to keep things as quiet as possible. Now in my testing, what I do is I set the factory fan curve inside of Afterburner. That way when I'm testing coolers, they're all running at the same percentages, which means at this temperature, this fan percent is uh, basically demanded. Now the difference is gonna be what the that RPM is based on what the max RPM is for these fans. So for instance, if we're asking for 50% of a 4,000 RPM fan, that's gonna be more speed in terms of RPM than asking for 50% of a 3,000 RPM fan. Now, I just pulled those numbers out of thin air. I um, didn't actually pay attention what the RPMs were. I didn't care. It was more about percentages and temperatures. So with the user-defined fan curve in the default setting in Afterburner, it's a pretty linear ramp, if you will. Um, well, not linear, it's actually more exponential, but they never hit higher than 70% on the fan speeds themselves, spending most of the time more so around 50, 55%. But the XC3 was actually quieter than the Founders Edition card uh, at the same percentages. Now, both of them on their factory fan curves as they ship out of the box are dead silent, you can't hear them, but they run warmer than I'd like them to. When I say warmer than I'd like them to, they reach about 72C in an open air test bench. You put them in a case, they'll probably go up about 5C depending on your case airflow. But with the user-defined fan curve, letting the RPM come up to, like I said, over 50, 55%, having a baseline of 40% and getting rid of the zero RPM, means that the EVGA card was also in the low 60s, usually sitting around 60, 61 C, but doing it, again, dead silent. The FE card, which I don't have on the table anymore after we obviously switched scenes here, it's having to move more air with less fans. The problem I have with that cooler is, although it's very quiet, there is an audible hum that comes from the actual motors. EVGA has upgraded the motors in their fans this time around. They are not using the same motor that was in the 20 series fans, although they look like the same fan with the same, what Phil dubs as the herpes E all over the fans. He's like, why are there herpes all over the fans? I don't know. I don't know why it's there. I don't know if there's a reason for it. They're not, they're like blurred out on the box. They're not even really shown very much, but regardless, you're looking at it that way, so does it really matter? They are weird looking though. Anyway, the point I was getting at, there is zero motor hum from this card whatsoever. And the fans make this like gentle breeze on a July afternoon in Cancun. 
with the little seagulls going by and the crash of the waves and if you're Vin Diesel, a Corona with lime, or if you're me, a Hefeweizen. Where are you going with this? It doesn't ruin your experience. But the point is, it's, it's really, really quiet. There's no motor noise. And even with the fans speeding up, it, it, it's, you're, you're not gonna hear it in a case, which is awesome. It's very traditional in the sense that it's got downdraft fans and all that, but I, I feel that there's this unnecessary desire. I don't know, is it a desire or, does it, or do they feel pressured to come up with a new cooler design every time? Because you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that's like, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Sometimes what happens is you go from having a great thing to maybe you sort of lost your way. I'm always gonna harp on this. And if you're one of those people that's like, I don't care about the, the, the aesthetics at all, zero, I really could not give less shots than, than, than the design, then you might wanna just go ahead and skip a couple minutes because I'm about to get a little ranty here. This is Jay's two cents after all, and I do have two cents to give and I'm gonna give it and it doesn't apply to everybody and that's perfectly fine. What is this? The first time Phil saw it, he goes, why does it look like a McLaren P1? And then we saw the cooler, we're like, oh my God, it's PX1. It's literally a P1. But I didn't see it like that. I saw it as a sad clown. You've got the subtle red line on the back, fine. I know I gave the Radeon design, you know, with their, with their pictures a hard time for having the red on there. Um, the, the back plate design is neat. It's got this opening here, so you don't have heat, heat soak on the back of the core, it can come out. You got this retention bracket back now to give plenty of tension on the cooler, so you get plenty good, you know, a real good even pressure across the die to give good cooling. One thing that makes it different too from the Founders Edition card is the fact that it has two eight pin uh, power or PCI Express plugs, which all the AIBs I've said before are not gonna, they're gonna have the standard plugs. They're not gonna be using the uh, 12 pin thing that Nvidia has because um, Obviously, if they're using the long PCB, they can stick them back here and use the full size. The, these plugs would not fit, physically fit on the FE card, which is one of the reasons why they went with the new plug. Um, but yeah, so if you're using uh, custom cables and stuff, you don't have to worry about suddenly you can't reuse your cables because fortunately the AIBs are using standard plugs. Um, the honeycomb, not really gonna do anything, I don't think. Not much air is gonna get through that. And I feel like that's the other thing. I feel like this time around, manufacturers felt very, very pressured to come up with some sort of a blow through design as well. Now we know Nvidia has a hand in the approval on a lot of these designs. And I don't know if there was a push to like, hey, you should have a blow through design. Or if people just sort of like the notch with Apple and the phone, if people just kind of started following suit. Um, there's trend setters and trend followers. But at the end of the day, the performance is still what it is. A, a ridiculously fast card that only pulls about 500 watts from the wall as a system total on an overclocked 10900K. So the 750 watt power supply requirement or recommendation I should say from Nvidia seems rather high, but I think that's because they want plenty of headroom because there's so much variance now on CPU on whether or not you're using whether you're a 16 core CPU or a four core. Back in the day it was easy. Four cores, eight threads was about as much as you can get. But with the variance now and the popularity of Ryzen multi-core CPUs, you have a lot more range of power draw. But if we talk about the design though, and I, and I started to get onto a little bit of a rant and I'm, and I'm sorry, EVJ, you know I love you. So you guys are aware, EVJ has talked to myself and a lot of people and have really listened to your comments. They are coming out with a trim cover for this or some sort of solution. They haven't decided exactly what it's gonna be yet, but it is it's going to still keep your warranty intact. Um, it's gonna be free to any of the owners of the card now or in the future where they don't know if it's gonna be a stick on or like a little, I basically said they should make one that's the same size and just sticks on it, a little adhesive, or let it go, um, and then just get rid of that and they'll be fine. Because the, the red trim, the red line right here is not that bad, it's just that. So here's what it kind of looks like. They gave me some, some examples of what they're working on here and it just, they just were like, can you please let your audience know we hear them, that they don't like the red? Because here's the thing, they heard us in the past. You remember this guy? Where I always said MSI, you've got some of the most aggressive, cool looking coolers I've seen. I love the Twin Frozer design. The Twin Frozer was something I loved for many, many years. And this is not a new MSI card. This is a 10 series card. This is actually a 1080 Ti. And I was like, guys, you would have a 10 of 10 from me if you didn't have the red. Well, if we take a look at what EVGA was making back then, look at this, look how sleek this is. It's aluminum. It's kind of a darker aluminum. It's more of a gunmetally. You don't have red everywhere. You have a nice solid back plate on here. It's just, this actually was Phil's favorite design of all of the EVGA cards they ever made. And so this, this is why we're comparing it because I feel like we've sort of lost our way a little bit here in terms of just cleanliness, I think. Sleek, sleek is an aesthetic too. Sometimes less is more. 
And that's what it kind of looks like from that angle. I, I, agree with, I agree with Phil, this is a beautiful card. As much as I have some complaints about the red, the performance on this card is absolutely phenomenal. It does exactly what you expect it to do. Um, whether or not it's worth $50 more than the FE, that probably depends on where you live. The FE is not gonna be available everywhere. It's not available in all regions. Um, many countries are not getting it at all. I think Nvidia is doing like a raffle where you could win one kind of a thing. But um, this card is gonna probably be, it's gonna be available in every region EVGA sells. And believe it or not, it's not the most outlandish design we've ever seen. But you know what? I, I know I'm harping on something that seems really superficial. Um, I just look at it this way. If you're spending $750, right? This is $50 more on the Founders Edition card. Um, it's gotta be something I can look at and not just be immediately struck with something I don't like. I'm holding it this way, because as you can see, if you have any case lighting, it's gonna illuminate the crap out of that red trim. But you know what though? It's not the most, out, most outlandish design we've seen yet. <laughs> that so far goes to this guy. <laughs> this is the eye game, or also the colorful cooler from the advanced card. <laughs> it's freaking heavy. This is, this is metal, this is not a plastic shroud. But anyway, I know I'm harping on this and I'm, and I'm being really kind of superficial on that. I just, I can't let, just like cable management, I care. I cannot look at a messy cable setup. I have to deal with it. Just like I need my cards that cost this much money to be something I look at and go, I'm proud of that purchase. Not, I like it, but that's why I said, if you're one of those people that's like, Jay, you're stupid. I don't care about what the card looks like. Good for you. And I'm serious when I say that, not oh, good for you. No, I'm serious. Good for you because I don't know what that feels like. I'm a little envious. Anyway, so there it is. You guys tell me whether or not you think it's worth it. What are your favorite AIB designs that you've seen so far? And what are your thoughts on this particular card and this generation uh, from EVGA? Performance wise, 10 out of 10 as far as I'm concerned. Aesthetics, I'll give it like a seven and a half out of 10. It could be worse. It's not gigantic. It's pretty much the size of a standard like Founders Edition card from any previous generation or reference board. It's not humongous like some of them can be. Um, you guys are the consumer. You guys, in your opinion, are the ones that reign supreme. So sound off in the comments below what you think about this one and what AIB card you'd like us to take a look at. We've got pretty much all of them coming up. You guys know how this goes. From now till Christmas, we'll be talking graphics cards and probably Zen 3. Maybe Radeon, depends on how long it takes me to be able to go and buy it because we know they're not gonna send it to me after yesterday's video. That's fine. Anyway guys, thanks for watching and as always, we'll see you in the next one.